to um, we'll, we'll start discussing it on Monday uh, and probably finish it up, finish up discussing it on Tuesday. But uh, you should see on my screen right here uh, a th this is really just I've, I've copied a couple of pages from our textbook and put it in there. This is section 1.1, right? So we talked about how you guys were to download your textbook. So you've got access either uh, you know virtually online or directly through that PDF that you guys downloaded. This is what it looks like. It just looks like any other textbook, right? Uh, where they've got problems and you've hopefully got answers. OK, uh, so what I'm going to ask you guys to do is for Monday. All right, with you know just pencil and paper doing it like you would normally do a homework assignment. I want y'all to do seven through forty two. OK, so numbers seven through forty two. This is where you probably write that down somewhere and say, ah, Coach Morgan's got a homework assignment. I'm going to do it. Numbers seven through forty two. OK, and the whole idea behind that is for you guys to get some practice. OK, practice. Hey, Coach Ken. Turn it in. This is mine. Did you did you, did you test yourself? Not testing. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Do it. Do it. Uh, you ninety-seven point three. You're cool. You're Sweet. Cool. cool as a cucumber. I have a question. I don't have the book downloaded. Where can I do that? Aha! Uh -huh. That's a great question, Paul Camillo. Uh, if you go to the website openstacks.org, openstacks.org. Thanks, Webster. Thank you. Um. Here, I'll show you on my screen. OK, and you select the uh, it's, it's intermediate algebra second edition is what it is. OK, so openstacks.org and then go through and find their math books. And it's um, here, I'm going to click click back right here. Openstacks.org and then it's intermediate algebra second edition. And so like when you click on that book, uh, Paul and whoever else hadn't had a chance to do this shit yet, uh, I recommend uh, clicking on the download a PDF, save it somewhere uh, smart on your uh, device so that you can have access to it. It's a pretty hefty file, uh, but once you guys download it, so like you you will be able to, at that point, you know, you'll be able to say, oh, okay, um, you know, here's section 1.1 and you click on it, it takes you to that section in the book. Uh, you look through some of the examples that you and I have worked in class because I'm kind of following along uh, with the text. And then at the end of each section, they've got your you know written exercises for you to practice, just like you would a normal textbook. So so like our learning objectives this is like what we're getting accomplished in this first section. And then you see some examples, you see some little how to things. Um, and then all the way down at the bottom. They'll have these exercises. Now, if it were me, um, you know, I would, I would, again, this is, it's up to your personal preference, but I, I kind of actually, I like to have stuff printed when I'm working on it. You know what I'm saying? So like, I wouldn't just roll up onto the internet with a piece of paper and start jotting things down. Again, personal preference, you don't have to do it this way, but what I, what I really like to do is I like to have a, a you know, those couple of those pages printed. So. I always I tell my students, um, you know, you may consider just accessing it through that PDF. OK, so give me a moment. I'll pull up what I'm talking about. Ooh, there's another mosquito. Missed him. Uh, let's see here. Y'all give me just a second. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Math courses. Algebra one. And then what page is it? It's at the end of section 1.1. So you just go to section 1.1. Hey, bud. All right. I have it. Oh, okay. I found a black helmet in the corner of a parking lot. I'll make sure that I ask around. That's weird. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Coach. Um, so, so, fellas, what I'm talking about, like you see on my screen right here, a little PDF. I, I actually, I tell my guys, they just print that. And you know that way you can have it's just a couple of pages. Um, print the uh, and by the way, Paul, it looks like it's page twenty one and twenty two in the text. Okay. So you can find it that way. Um, and, and then I just tell them, you know, if you don't have enough room to work on there, that's where the pencil and paper, uh, notebook paper, kind of comes in handy. But um, you know, do what you like to do. It does not matter. 
I'm not going to be taking this up. It's not like you're going to say, Coach Morgan, here's my paper. Okay. Um, but what I'm going to be doing is uh, giving you guys a quiz over the problems that you see here, the problem types that you see here eventually. So you want to do it, right? You want to make sure you do the homework. And, and when you guys are working the homework, you'll have questions and we'll address those in class. So like, let's say I give this assignment and I say, hey, this assignment is due on uh, Monday, right? You'll roll up in here tomorrow or you'll roll up in here Monday and you'll say, hey, can we, can we talk about number 22? Can we talk about number 38? You know, and I'll answer a couple of questions and that way we get a good discussion going. Okay, that's typically how I like to do things regarding homework. Okay, y'all got any questions about that? Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, so with that being said, y'all got your notes out. We're ready to do some examples, kind of helping you get ready for that homework, which by the way, is not a super challenging assignment. Uh, it's it's going to be covering some of the basic types of things uh, that normally you would see in an algebra class. All right, so we talked last time we met about the notion of a multiple, right? And a multiple, remember, uh, has to do with the notion of, okay, 27 is a multiple of nine, if I can express 27 as nine times some type of number. What? Who remembers that, that name of that type of number? What was the type of number? Is a whole number. What's your name? Jack, Jack McBee? Excellent. OK, I remember. Good. I'm trying to learn names and faces. Um, you know, OK, so we'll go a little further than saying a whole number. It was an integer. An integer. integer. Very good. Very good. So 27 I could express as nine times some integer. You guys would just say nine times three, right? And so we would say ding, 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 ding. Yes, 27 is a multiple of nine. Now that's cake. That's easy. That's real basic, isn't it? But when we get to some bigger numbers, it might not be like I don't necessarily know off the top of my head what times nine might equal 126. But I don't necessarily have to know that because we have these nifty little things called divisibility tests, right? Divisibility tests are awesome. When we learn about our divisibility tests, it makes life a little bit easier. Um, so, Andrew, what's our divisibility test for nine? Do you remember? Actually, all of them, all of them. Yeah, very good. OK, so so Andrew, if you didn't hear at home, Andrew said, hey, the divisibility test for nine is that if you sum up all of the digits, one plus two plus six in this case, if that sum is itself a multiple of nine, then we are guaranteed that the number is a multiple of nine, for instance. OK, uh, and so you would say, yep, the second one is. What about that third one? You know, Reed, what do you think about that third one? Is it a multiple of nine? Based on this rule Andrew just quoted. It's not. So when we talk about the divisibility test, we'd say, sorry, this one's not because two plus five plus one does not equal a multiple of nine. OK, it doesn't equal what we, what we want it to it equals eight. So there you go. All right. Uh, what are some other divisibility tests? OK, so every everything that's even is divisible by two. Uh, everything that's when, again, you sum up the digits and it's a multiple of three, then it's divisible by three. Um, what about a uh, divisibility test for, is um, there another one for six? What does it have to be uh, in order for something, a number to be divisible by six? Uh, let's see, Jack. All right, that's not a bad guess. It's uh, so not, not exactly that way. Um, Jack McBee. The numbers uh, we're getting a little closer. It doesn't have to do with the numbers adding up. Does anybody at home know how I can check to see if something's divisible by six? What do you think there, Mossy? It has to be a multiple of two and three. Bingo. It's got to be divisible by two and by three, and then it fits the bill. Very good. So if it's a multiple of both two and three, then it's a multiple of six, okay? And notice I'm using these two words, not interchangeably, but just in the same context. I'm talking about divisibility and being a multiple, right? So like 18 is divisible by six, 
Therefore, 18 is a other word? Multiple. Multiple of six, right? So 18 is a, a multiple of six. And then, uh, Masi, you got your hand still up. You got another question or comment? No? Uh, Griffith, what about you? Did you have a hand up? Chuck? Charlie? No. OK. Charlie, did you did you paint that rooster behind you? Yeah, that was my grandmother. That was your grandmother? Yep. I guess uh, I guess not. So um, all right, we talked about divisibility. Let's discuss the notion of something being a factor. Okay. Uh, the word factor here uh, means that if well, I'll use my 18 again as an example. Right. We we can talk about splitting 18 up into some factor pairs, right? I might express 18 as one times 18 or two times nine or three times six. All of those numbers are factors because 18 is divisible by them. OK, 18 is divisible by uh, six. Therefore, six is a factor of 18. Is 18 divisible by five? Say no. 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 Therefore, five is not a factor of 18 okay so here's a, an example for us to practice talking about factors and this, again we're doing easy stuff to begin with right so 10 it says list all the natural number factors of 10 so natural numbers remember one two three four so on and so forth so if it's a natural number factor of 10 uh, that means that it divides into 10 evenly and it is a positive counting number okay so one times 10 and two times five, those are the only natural number factors of 10. Now, could I say 10 divided by three? Is that a legitimate multi, uh, division problem? Yeah, of course it is, right? If I said 10 divided by three, oops, sorry, I was, my elbow hit the keyboard here. If I said 10 divided by three, that's 3.3 .3 repeating, isn't it? Or three and a third. So like that, that is a number. It's just not a natural number, okay? Uh, it's not divisible by three in that it doesn't go in evenly. There's that little R word. It's kind of leftovers. We call it what in math? Remainder, good. So if we get a remainder of zero upon division, then we know that that divisor was a factor of the number. How about 36? Let me pick on some people that are at home today. Uh, let's see here. Bolio. Yes. How did, yes. Do, how did I do on saying that today, by the way? Oh, uh, it's right. Jackpot. Yes. Uh, Bolio, pick me a pair of factors of 36. Um, six times six. Six times six. All right. You went straight to the bottom of my list. No problem. No worries. Six times six. All right, uh, let's see here. Oh, you know what? Uh, I hadn't heard from Luke Sublet yet. Sublet, how about you, buddy? What's another uh, factor pair? One times 36. Oh, now we're at the top of my list. Bingo. Let's see if we can fill in the middle. Okay. Uh, Lewis, hit me up. Nine times four. All right, you went backwards on me. Four times nine. I'm going to write it out that way. And then uh, let's see here. Kozlowski, are you on the call today? Do I see Kozlowski? Two times 18. Two times 18. Very good. And then uh, let's go with Jake Oxley for the for the uh, finishing it up. 12 times 3. Also known as 3 times 12. All right. Now, it may seem that I'm being a little bit persnickety, right? George, you get all those down, by the way. Yeah, I mean, you got, you got, see how I wrote this up? You got it down in here, it's looking like that. Uh, I was a bit, uh, you know, particular about how I wanted this list written up, okay? And, and I mean, I'm not trying to be uh, like a stickler for how you do things. I don't want you guys to be a bunch of a little math, uh, Morgan math robots, okay? You don't all have to do things like I do. It's like with baseball, okay? 
So I, I pitched. I was a pitcher in high school and in college. And, and so that's one of the things when I am coaching baseball, I help the guys make sure that they are doing a good job of pitching. But I don't make them all throw exactly like I did. Okay? So they each throw the way that they need to throw as long as they keep in mind some of the basic tenets of good mechanics with pitching. Same thing here in math. And good mechanics, when you're talking about factor pairs, is listing the factor pairs out in a proper order. We don't want to just go all nimbly bimbly and start throwing numbers on the page because we might do what? We, we might forget one. Okay, so there needs to be an order. There needs to be a method. And, and have you kind of identified what my method is here? What do you think, Will Edwards? Yeah, I started with one and I worked my way down. Now down here, what you'll notice down here is where we, I like to call this is where we turn the corner. So we start with one, two, three, four, five doesn't go into 36, six goes into 36, seven does not, eight does not, nine does, but it's already on my list. I've turned the corner. So when you turn the corner, your list is complete. In other words, when you get to a number that's already on your list, then you can stop. And here's a little nugget, a little extra nugget that I'm not writing down, but that you should write down. You will turn the corner at or around the square root of your number. Not that I've taught you guys all about square roots just yet, but the notion is that you'll turn the corner somewhere in the neighborhood of the square root of that number. So notice where did we turn the corner? Over here, we turned the corner at two. Well, guess what? The square root of 10 is about 3.1 or 3.2. And that's in the ballpark of the number two. So we turn the corner at or around the square root of a number. Now, the reason I'm being particular about this is I want to make sure you guys understand how to come up with a factor pair list. Because when we start dealing with bigger numbers, when we start dealing with the factoring techniques that you guys learn in Algebra 1, it can be much more challenging. OK, any questions about listing out the factor pairs of a number? A little basic exercise here for us. All right. Grove, if you're going to teach like a champion, you got to hydrate like a champion, brother. I tell you what, that's some high quality H2O right there. Mm. Are you all water drinkers? Do you all like drinking water a bunch? Sometimes. Kinda. Sometimes. Uh, Memphis water. Dude, you ain't kidding, man. Memphis water is where it's at. We live out in Fayette County and we live on a well and uh, we got some good well water out there where I live and uh, it's nice. But um, hey, Mr. Uh, Mr. Joe Edwards. What's your drink of choice? You got, oh, you got water in there? Water, yes. Nice, that a boy. My wife is, is a coffee drinker. She likes coffee in the mornings. Uh, I never have been able to drink much coffee. It's too bitter for me, I think. I'm a sweet, I got a sweet tooth kind of kind of guy. But uh, she likes coffee and she likes tea. But I'll just stick to water. Thank you very much. Uh-oh, got myself a comment here. Let's see here, who's commenting? Kind of kills the mood when it takes forever to come up meeting chat. Maybe I'll just leave my meeting chat up there. Milk is superior. Milk is superior. <clears throat> you know that humans. And I, please excuse me, if fortune one, two, three, remind me who, who I'm talking to. It's James Jacobs. Oh, OK, gotcha, James. Dude, Jacobs, by the way, I ran into your dad yesterday and I made the connection finally. Uh, he and I have known each other for a long time. Um, and then I, I realized, oh, OK, dude, awesome. Um, so w humans are some of the only animals on the planet that consume milk from other animals. You guys, you guys realize that? Isn't that kind of weird? Yeah. Tiago's just checking in. What's up, Tiago? Um, I mean, think about it. Like, you ever see a lion cub suckling on a pig or something? No. All right. You don't see a dog going up to a, a mama kitty cat and, and getting, getting milk that way. Not gonna uh -oh. lie, that's kind of gross. Yeah. So, so like, if you guys, uh, not to again, not to get too gross here, but if you guys were little babies and you were nursing on your mother's breast, that would be natural. That's the way 
You know, that's the way God made it. And yet, here you are, Mr. Jacobs, saying that milk is a superior drink when milk, you know where milk dead gum comes from? It comes from a big, ugly, stinky cow. My goodness. And Only I thing I like milk for is ice cream. I'll take milk with some ice cream. Uh, and, and there you go. I don't think humans are even supposed to digest dairy. Yeah, you know, and, and what do they call that? They call that uh, being lactose intolerant, right? Anybody lactose intolerant? Anybody? That would be a tough way to go, man. That'd be a tough existence, not being able to consume things like milk uh, or, or dairy products, cheese. I mean, come on. All right, but I digress. We have about five or six minutes left. I want to talk. I got a couple more definitions on the screen for you guys. All right. And when we uh, when we look at the, the phrase prime factorization, I always think of Optimus Prime, uh, who is a what, George? A transformer. All right. Prime factorization, uh, you know, just sounds one of those fancy things. It's not bad at all. Is where you take a number, maybe it's like the number 36, and you express it as a product of prime factors. So, like, I might take the number 36 and write it as 2 squared times 3 squared. That's all that that is. But it depends on our ability to understand what the word prime means, doesn't it? Okay. Take a mosquito. He's sneak attacking me up here. Hmm. So um, read when, when we say prime number, right? Obviously, I've got my definition up here. Give me some examples of some prime numbers. Seven, Seven is a is a prime number. Eleven. Uh, Eleven. Very good. Eleven is a prime. Number. And in fact, Eight. you know, is is there is there a set like finite number amount of fi of uh, prime numbers? And it keeps on going and going and going, right? And and the notion behind prime numbers is it's one of those things in math that is is just real interesting, okay? And and kind of mysterious in a mathematical way. <clears throat> so I don't know if you guys do much research in the field of mathematics, if you study uh, or look for articles about new mathy things, but there is actually a prize that is offered to mathematicians that are able to um, work well with prime numbers. And the prize is $1 million. And I'm not joking you on that. They have a prize out there of a million dollars for the next man or woman who finds uh, the next largest prime number, okay? So like, what do I mean by the next largest prime number? Look at my little piece of uh, uh, chart here. You guys don't have to copy this down. This will be where you just kind of watch. But there was a guy back in antiquity called uh, Eratosthenes, and he developed a sieve method. A sieve is, is kind of like a sifter, like if you've ever sifted flour or powdered sugar or anything, it, it holds the, the larger things and lets the smaller things go through. A sieve uh, approach is how he, he went about looking and finding prime numbers. So he said, for instance, one by definition is not prime. Two, in fact, is the smallest prime number because it has exactly two natural number factors one and itself okay and and if two is a prime number then every multiple of two must therefore be composite okay like the number eight is composite i.e not prime because i can express eight as yes one times eight but also two times something else so what eratosthenes did was he scratched out all of the multiples of two all the multiples of two and he cut his list down in half. And then he went up and he said, OK, three is my next prime number. Let me cancel out all the multiples of three. And the way that you would do that in this chart, at least, is with the diagonals. Hmm. Nine, whoops, excuse me. Nine. And then down here. And just for time's sake, I'm going to stop after a couple more. Right. Uh, but what you're doing is you're sifting through or you're you're going through and you're saying, ah, oh, five is a prime number. Let me cancel out all the multiples of five. Seven is a prime number. And then you, you would go through 
Uh, like, let's see here. 28's off the list. 35's off the list. 42's off the list. 49 needs to get scratched out. Um, Y'all help me. 56, 63, 70, 77 needs to get off the list. 84, 91 needs to come off the list. So what you're doing is you're canceling out all of these multiples. And what are you going to be left with? What remains? Your prime numbers. Yeah, your prime numbers. And so, like, uh, eventually you would go through and you'd make sure you had canceled out all of the, the multiples. And you've got this list of prime numbers. Now, can you imagine doing that by hand with, like, really big numbers? That'd be a pain in the neck. Like, how could I check to see if 2,437,871 is prime? Okay. I have to divide that number by every number that preceded it to check to see if it indeed is divisible but only by one and itself. Okay. So they write, nowadays, they write what to do that for them? Code. Yeah, computer programs. They write computer programs to do that. Hence the million dollar prize. Because in order to run that high volume of divisions in a timely and efficient manner, you need to have a pretty robust computer program written. Very efficient, and very well done. And, and the computer program that gets written that way earns a million dollars because then that computer program could be taken and, and shoehorned into other applications, okay? So like they might solve this problem of finding the next prime number, and then they might use the technological advances of that to solve some other more widely applicable problems, okay? Uh, and by the way, the not the very last guy, but the guy before the last guy that found the, the next biggest prime number lived in Collierville, and uh, he was working in conjunction with, uh, I think it was U of M, but it was a couple of local universities who used their, their computing power. Um, and the number that he found, the prime number that he found, was so large that if you were to print it on a piece of paper, single space, normal font size, digit after digit after digit after digit, that number would be so long that it would take up enough paper to fill the Harry Potter series uh, of, of books. You know, like imagine you're on your bookshelf at home, you got your Harry Potter series of books. If you just started printing page after page after page after page of digits, it would fill that whole Harry Potter series. It was that big of a number, okay? So, I mean, isn't that, isn't that nuts? Prime numbers are cuckoo. So if you study prime numbers one day, uh, you'll maybe, maybe you'll win a million dollars. You can come back and give me a little bit of it. All right. Um, Y'all got about uh, four more minutes, fellas. Had some guys coming in early. My, I'm, I'm losing my voice. So I'm going to try and wrap things up with our third example, third and final example. So prime factorization, I already talked about the number 36. I wrote it as two squared and three squared. But how did I do that? Okay. I used an approach that some of you guys have done before uh, called uh, a, a tree approach. All right. So, like, imagine the roots of a tree. And we start with a prime number like two. Two and 18. Okay. And then 18 splits up as two and nine. Nine splits up as three and three. And all of these guys down here are prime numbers. Therefore, I can't split them up any further. Okay, so that's why I wrote it up as two squared times three squared. Okay, now please make a note of this that when you're doing prime factorization, notice I did not write two times two times three times three. That's incorrect. Okay, Joey, why is that considered incorrect as opposed to this? What did I do up here that I didn't do down here? What did I use up here that's this? proper use. I used exponents. Make a note to that effect. Say when I'm doing prime factorization, I need to use exponents. Okay. And you'll notice also that I put them in order ascendingly. Okay. I put them in ascending order. What was your definition for a prime number? A number that has exactly two natural number factors. Exactly two, no more, no less. So the, the number seven that somebody called out a minute ago is prime because the only two natural number factors are one and seven. The number one by definition is not prime because it does not have exactly two natural number factors. It only has one natural number factor, which is one. 
Therefore, one is not prime. Two is the smallest prime number. You'll need to know that. On your exam in the fall, I always like to ask a question like, true or false, the sum of the first 10 prime numbers equals, I don't know what, like 78. And so therefore, it's an easy enough question if you know what a prime number is and you know what the first prime number is and you can quickly calculate what are, what are my other prime numbers and then you just add them up. Uh, but so you want to make sure what's the smallest prime number again? Two, two is the smallest prime number. All right, and then I'll leave you with 900. Uh, we could split this up using a different approach. Sometimes I like the upside down wedding cake approach. Y'all ever seen one of those wedding cakes with like all the tiers? They build up bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So upside down wedding cake, here we go, two and 450, two and 225. No longer is that divisible by two. So I move on to the next prime number, which is three, and I check divisibility of three. This is divisible by three because two plus two plus five equals three, uh, excuse me, equals a uh, multiple of three. Uh, and it splits up as 75, which again is divisible by three. Those, that's no longer divisible by 3, but that is divisible by 5. And therefore, 900 would be 2 squared times 3 squared times 5 squared. And I'm using exponents in ascending order. All right. Now, um, we've gone through quite a bit today, so I'm going to go ahead and cut you off. And uh, I will say this, that I've posted a practice quiz for you guys in Microsoft Teams. Okay. So in our general channel, where you normally go to find the uh, meeting to join, you'll find a little practice quiz. Uh, sometime before Saturday at midnight, take that little ACT practice quiz, see how you do, and then we'll maybe discuss that tomorrow or Monday, okay? Live Jesus in our hearts. Forever. Forever. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Y'all skedaddle on out of here, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye. See you, fellas.